I remember the first day of seminary, I uh, went into my introduction to the Old Testament class, and uh, the professor looked around and I said, I want to get you warmed up, so please open up your Bibles and uh, read Hezekiah 3.16 and turn to your neighbor and discuss it together. Hand slowly went up in the back of the classroom and said, Professor, there is no book of Hezekiah. Some of you are looking at the bulletin or maybe uh, at some place else and going, Habakkuk? There's a book of Habakkuk? Somebody the first, after the first service asked me, is it Habakkuk or Habakkuk? And I said, I say them both the same way, and it's probably Habakkuk. <laughs> However you want to say it. I don't think you're going to get confused with about uh, how, uh, which one I'm referring to. So you're wondering, is it re- are we really going to read from Habakkuk this morning? Or is you know, Pastor Ivan just starting to make stuff up? Um, I heard a story one time of a preacher who so seldom preached on Habakkuk that he opened his Bible to read to the congregation and couldn't find it. So just opened to the Psalms and read from that instead. So yes, there is Habakkuk in the Old Testament, and he's often considered one of the minor prophets, one of the 12 minor prophets. Uh, And that is simply a reference minor to the length of the book, not necessarily to the importance of the book. Uh, So we don't know much about the author, about the prophet Habakkuk, but there's some things that we can learn from the context in which he wrote. We can tell that he wrote probably from Jerusalem, and uh, he probably wrote uh, in that southern kingdom of Judah after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel. So this would be sometime around, the say, about year 600 B.C., Uh, but it was before the fall of the kingdom of Judah to the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, as they're called in the book of Habakkuk. So that meant that in that time period, in Jerusalem and around Jerusalem, times were tough. The fertile crescent where Jerusalem and Israel is was constantly being trampled by the armies of the superpowers of the day. And it is under that kind of tension, under that kind of constant threat, that Habakkuk, the prophet of the Lord, has his conversations with God. So I'm going to read the first four chapters of verse, uh, sorry, the first four verses of chapter one. And then I'm going to read the first four verses of chapter two, but I'm going to wait until later in in the sermon to get to that section because what happens in between those two is really important. So here now from chapter one. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. Here ends this portion of the reading. As a child, I grew up uh, watching the news and listening to the news. I knew what was going on in the world around me. I remember from an early age, my parents listening to classical music on the radio, and at the top of the hour uh, would be the news announcements, the headlines of the day. Dad would often watch the evening news, six o'clock, seven o'clock news, and we'd watch it in Spanish because we were living in Ecuador at the time, and we needed to know what was going on around us. Just for our own safety, we needed to know if there was going to be a transportation strike, for example, the next day, or if the students were going to be protesting. Are we going to be able to get to work? Are we going to be able to get to school? It's how we found out what was going on. It affected our daily lives, and watching the news was an important part of that But it also meant that it was kind of a simpler time, a simpler time for me, but also it seems in our world, perhaps. I stopped watching the news, the evening news, when I was 13, because it was then that I remember watching cable news for the first time. 
Uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq in the first Gulf War, February 1991. I had a hard time turning off the television. I would remember watching video rolling of tracer fire from the anti-aircraft guns in Baghdad. Reporters talking nonstop about Scud missiles and chemical weapons attacks. Patriot defense missiles trying to protect against those Scuds. And videos of burning tanks, helicopters flying over sand berms. It was fascinating to me. It was frightening to me. And it was very far, far away. And yet, the violence that was right there before me, it was so present. It was right in front of me on that television screen. Later on as a teenager and then on into college, there were times that I considered myself a news junkie. TV was always on, headline news, or the Weather Channel, especially if it's wintertime and there might be some snow coming. In the early 2000s, we were spending more time online, and my browser homepage was set to CNN.com. We moved to Washington, D.C. for grad school, and I would pick up the copy of the Washington Post on my walk to the metro station, and then I would carry it with me on the metro, and then as we got off and I went into uh, Capitol Hill when I was interning at the Presbyterian Washington office, or to the, the church where I was interning at New York Avenue Presbyterian. And times have changed since, the, since then, and I, I don't think of myself as a news junkie anymore. I don't use that kind of terminology for myself because even though I still subscribe to the Sunday paper, even though I'm a public radio listener and member, and even though I stay current with global news and local events, I don't really enjoy it the way I used to. I don't enjoy keeping up with the news the way that I used to, and I think it's partly to do with social media and the way that it, there's this clickbaity news that, that uh, if it bleeds, it leads urgency, or there's kind of a hook in there. Top 10 reasons why you should pay attention to the impeachment. Uh, you won't believe number seven, right? And it's that kind of stuff that hooks people in. And I can't get away from that. It, I get news notifications on my phone from at least five different news outlets, both local and global. And I love it and I hate it at the same time. I open up Facebook to check on our family and on church members and I see the violence and the conspiracy theories that are always before me. Yesterday I was going to go watch the Rugby World Cup final between England and South Africa. It, uh, the, the Rugby World Cup was taking place in Japan, so the games were at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was not going to watch it at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was going to go over to the Holland's house at 4. We were going to watch the replay together and I'll enjoy the game. I rolled over yesterday morning and as I was, I forget, brushing my teeth or something, and my phone went bleep, bleep. And I looked at it and it says, South Africa wins Rugby World Cup. <laughs> I wanted to watch the game. I wanted to be surprised, and yet there was no surprise anymore. Yeah, smothered. We are smothered by news, and it's ever-present with us, and we can't really get away from it. There are some times where we might be able to take a tech Sabbath and a new Sabbath and just put it away. But more and more, it's overwhelming. And I can blame my phone and I can blame social media all I want to, but the reality is that being overwhelmed by the if it bleeds, it leads news is part of our basic human experience. And why do I say that? Because I also can look to Habakkuk, who can't turn away from violence or injustice. That surrounds him. He can't get away from it. He complains to God in faith. He complains, why do you make me look at all the wrongdoing, at all the trouble? Destruction and violence are ever before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. This is Habakkuk's plea. This is his lament to God. It seems... To us, just like to Habakkuk, that the more we are surrounded by injustice, the more we see the failures of the rule of law. The greater the injustice, the greater the spin, the greater the manipulation of truth, justice never really has a chance, it seems. This is the role of the prophet, to speak truth. 
Not to tell the future, as sometimes we might think, but to speak the hard truth about the present, even when few want to hear it. So Habakkuk, who is telling truth, now turns his truth-telling not to the people, but toward God. And basically says, now God, you need to do something about this injustice. So how does God respond? And it's a part that I did not read, but it's in verses 5 through 11. God says, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. God says, you're right. Injustice is terrible. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and their ruthless army, and they're just going to march all over you. And they're going to destroy you so I can put a stop to this injustice. Hmm. I don't think that was the response that Habakkuk was waiting for. Have you ever seen the look on someone's face when uh, they've heard exactly the opposite of what they were expecting? I kind of imagine that's what Habakkuk had on his face at that moment. Habakkuk is complaining to God, hey God, the neighborhood's on fire, and God says, I'll send you a fire truck. It's filled with gasoline. And Habakkuk goes, you're crazy. That is not what you are supposed to do, and that is not who you are. That is Habakkuk's response. Habakkuk says, this is not who you are. This is a terrible idea, just meeting more violence with violence. This isn't you. There's some prophets in the Old Testament, like Joel, who might say, well, you know, even the righteous might deserve this in some way, so God is right. Habakkuk says, this isn't right, and this isn't you. Verse 13, Habakkuk says, Your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing, O God. So why do you tolerate the faithless? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those who are more righteous than themselves? So Habakkuk rejects God's solution. But instead of walking away from God, and turning his back on God, like perhaps many of us are wont to do, Habakkuk keeps up the conversation keeps engaged with God. He works to convince God that violence against violence is not the answer. Habakkuk relies on faith even when God's solution is more unjust than the original problem. So Habakkuk goes on now to say at the beginning of chapter 2, this is the other part of the reading, Habakkuk says, I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what God will say to me and what God will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and it does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, Habakkuk called out to God and said, your answer isn't good enough. It isn't like you. So I'm going to wait right here until you give me a better answer. And I'm going to watch. And I'm going to wait. It reminds me of a quote that Jimmy Carter, who's been teaching weekly Sunday school since he left the White House in 1981, uh, he, and he once wrote, God answers all our prayers. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is, you've got to be kidding me. He actually wrote that. I would add to that, according to Habakkuk, Sometimes God's answer is not yet. Yes, no, not yet. God comes back to Habakkuk and says, you're faithful in waiting, but your answer may not come in the time you want it to. There is a vision, there is good news coming, and it will surely come. Can you hear the echoes of Jesus teaching so that the kingdom of God is drawing near? Can you hear this teaching of Jesus? It's already here, but it's also not yet here. Not completely. 
Habakkuk's challenge is the same as your challenge and my challenge. We can see the world around us and know that the world is not as it should be. But we hold on to something that it is becoming so. That is the hope. It is becoming as it should be. Today we will toll the bell and we will remember the saints of this church who have died and gone before us. Some have lived full lives and some have left us too soon. And we lament and we grieve, we remember, and we celebrate the lives that we have together and the lives we have in God. And we eagerly await the promised day when there will be no more crying or sorrow and death itself will be no more. But until that day, we are surrounded by complex problems. We have problems of homelessness and hunger and greed and violence on our streets. And how do we respond? Well, we should respond as Habakkuk did. We can reject that violence is ever a solution to violence. We reject that God would ever act in such a way. And we wait for and embrace a gospel of peace where we respond to the deep need of the world, not by hating or fearing the world, but by loving it. We face evil by acting in love. We confront selfish greed by giving what we have for the good of someone else. In a world that might seem to us to be crumbling around us, we commit ourselves to being faithful stewards of that which has been entrusted to us. It might be a small piece of the puzzle, but it is still a piece. We might not be able to solve homelessness, but we can solve homelessness for one family through family promise. We can house those who are in need of winter shelter through Carmichael Hart. We may not be able to solve the big problem of hunger in our world, but we can solve the hunger for 25 families a day, every weekday through our Carmichael food closet. We may not be able to fix our broken immigration system, but we can welcome our new neighbors and provide space for English classes so they can more easily navigate the culture now in which they live. We may not be able to remove death from our experience of being human, but we can wait for the day when our God, who can, will do so. And until that day, we care for and love each other in our griefs and our losses, because that is what our Lord Jesus has done for us. We wait for the fulfillment of God's promise, and as stewards of the gifts that God has given us, we cast a vision in our world that is so big that even a runner who's going by at full clip can see it. A vision so enduring that not even death can keep it from becoming. A vision so compelling that it will shake us from our media-induced states of feeling overwhelmed at everything to realize, hey, hey, in this faith community, how we live our faith in love, that is worth every dollar every moment, every breath, every creative thought that we can put into it. We'll keep up our dialogue with God. We'll keep, up at, we'll keep at the work of loving one another and stewarding creation until that day when God's law of love not only guides us, but becomes real for each and every person. Let us pray. Strengthen us, O oh God, on this journey of faith. When the vision of your good news becomes muddied, clear our eyes. When injustice and violence seem to be all around us, hear our complaints. For only you have the, the power to fulfill our every need. As we join Habakkuk on that watchtower, 
proclaiming your vision of peace and justice for this world. We do so not because this is what we believe about ourselves, but because this is what we believe about you. With the loving and giving nature of Christ, we lift our prayer to you. Amen. Thank <clears throat> you.